I wonder how long it took for Jesus' disciples to sort out what it was that he really wanted them to do. It's not merely that they were obtuse, although there are times when you read through the gospel accounts you really kind of think they were. And it's not merely that Jesus was difficult, although you read the gospel accounts and sometimes you think that he was. The problem was that the ideas that Jesus was presenting to them were absolutely new to them. They were, you talk about thinking outside the box, they were having trouble keeping track of where the box was because Jesus was new wine. And in a sense, they were, they were old bottles. They had gotten used to Judaism. They were used to their own brand of it, uh, which probably in most of their cases wasn't very formal in any case. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. These were not highly religious men until Jesus came on the scene and called them, as far as we can tell. But they had trouble with what Jesus told them, and it took a long time, I think, for them to sort, them, sort these things out. Now, what you read in the New Testament is not really an accurate reflection of the way they felt at the time or the level of understanding they had at the time Jesus told them these things. Because by the time they wrote these down, oh, some 15, 20, 30 years had passed, and they'd had time to digest them. They'd had time to grasp the meaning of them. They had time for experience on the one hand, the Holy Spirit on another hand, and then on still another hand, the, the awareness of Jesus' words all to blend together like a fine old stew and finally merge the flavors until they understood far better what it was they were doing and why it was they were supposed to be doing these things. And so at this time of year, you know, the, 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 we go back and we read through the gospel accounts sometimes about what it was that was happening. When Mary came to the disciples and told them that Jesus was alive on Sunday morning after his crucifixion and his death on Wednesday, it was, they just didn't really believe it. They, they, they couldn't make it out. It was a shock to their system because, and hers, hers as well, because she had been out there crying by the graveside. And when Jesus first spoke to her, he, she thought he was the gardener. She did not even recognize him for who he was. And one wonders if he was as that much changed or if it was just that we would not, in those circumstances, be able to allow ourselves to believe that the person we were talking to was who it was. Because after all, we had seen him die. We had seen him taken down his limp body off the stake. We had seen him wrap him in the clothes. We'd seen him put him in the tomb and roll the stone across it. And then to turn around a few days later and run into him on a hillside was a little bit more than Mary could handle. And when the, she came and told the disciples that he was alive, they weren't able to handle it. In fact, it was such a shock, I think, to all their systems, it's really a marvel that they could even think straight during those days, those few hours, the, the, the initial weeks, frankly, leading up to Pentecost and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus appeared to Mary early in the morning, but he didn't actually talk to the men until that night. It was on a Sunday night, and you'll find the account in John, the 20th chapter, and it began beginning in verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled, because they were afraid of the Jews, and well, they might have been. I mean, their leader had just been killed, and what was going to happen to the rest of them? And Jesus came and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. You know, one minute he is there, and not there, and the next minute he is there. Again, you talk about a shock to the system, and it, it's, it's a marvel, again, that they could even speak. When he had sh said this, he showed them his hands, and he showed them his side, and then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord and finally began to believe that it really was him and that he really was alive. And he said to them, peace be unto you. As my father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said, receive you the Holy Spirit. Now there's some question in people's minds as to whether this was the moment when they received the Holy Spirit or whether this was a symbolic act of some kind, but it's really, I don't think that that's necessary to think of it in those terms. It's pretty evident to me that when Jesus comes to them, lays hands on them, breathes on them, and says, receive the Holy Spirit, that is the moment when these men receive the Holy Spirit. What happened a few days later on Pentecost is when they were empowered with the Holy Spirit, which is a little different from receiving it. And I think that's how you should understand what happens to you when you're baptized, you come up out of the waters, and they lay hands on you and pray for, God, for you to receive God's Spirit, what happens to you is what happened to these men at this moment. You receive God's Spirit. And the time of the empowerment with God's Spirit 
is another matter altogether. And that depends on what God wants you to do, when he wants you to do it, where he wants you to do it, and how he wants you to do it. Then he said this strange thing. He said, whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Now that's a lot of power. It certainly sounds like a lot of power to be able to just say, you know, when somebody comes and let's say confesses the sin and says, look what I've done, I'm sorry. And you can remit that sin or you can retain that sin. That sounds like a lot. But it's not exactly as you and I would think. Because what Jesus is doing, this is the moment when the interpretive authority for the scriptures passes from the, Jude the, the structure of Judaism at the time. It passes to the apostles of the church as far as God is concerned and as far as his church is concerned. From this moment on, Jesus Christ and these men are the interpretive authority for the Bible. That is for the law, the prophets, and whatever else. So it's the interpretation of Peter and James and John and Mark and the others that begins to, to account for the decisions that we make. Now, in the, there's a name for this in Hebrew for the interpretive authority that a, a, a Jewish community has. They are, in Old Testament, they were the priests and the Levites, or in some cases, the judges that were established in those days. And they developed a, a, a whole body, a whole corpus, as it were, of interpretations by which their people lived. Well, Jesus came on the scene and with the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you've heard it's been said by the interpretive authority of old, thou shalt do this. But I say unto you, and he began to give them a new interpretation of the law, which, as I said in the radio program recently, was not so much raising the bar as it was moving the bar closer to you in the sense that you realize that you have stepped over the line into sin earlier sometimes than you think you have. Either in old times they told you, well, if you could just abstain from committing adultery, you were all right. You know, if you didn't actually do the act, if you didn't actually sneak into her house at night and go to bed with another man's wife, you hadn't done anything wrong. Jesus said, oh no, when you start lusting after that woman in your heart and contemplating doing that, you're already over the line. This is his interpretive authority, his interpretation of the law and the law's application to people. So what he does at this point is he says, okay, you are now, I saw, I told you earlier that whatever the scribes and Pharisees did, said to do, you do that because they sit in Moses' seat. What I'm telling you now is that you sit in that seat. You are the interpretive power or the authority, as it were, for the church. And, of course, that authority in the Moses for the church is who? Jesus. And these men serve under him, and they are the authority for interpreting the law. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples therefore said to him, We've seen the Lord. But he said, Except I see in his hands the print of his nails, unless I put my hand into his side, I'm not going to believe it. Now, you can look back on this after all this time, and we call him Doubting Thomas, and, and he can get chided a little bit for it. But you have to realize that nothing like this had ever happened before. He had seen Jesus die. He knew that he was dead. And then to have some, even I don't care if they're your best friends. I don't care if you trust them with your life. For them to sit there and tell you that he was, well, I know he was dead, but he's alive and we've seen him, was just more than he could believe. He said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it. Well, Jesus was patient with him. Eight days later, now, if you get the picture on this, the first event took place on a Sunday evening, which is about halfway through the Days of Unleavened Bread. In the meantime, the Days of Unleavened Bread is over. We've come to this day, passed it, and gone beyond to another Sunday evening when the disciples are once again gathered together in one place. And this time, Thomas is there. And then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and he stood in the middle of them and said, Peace be unto you. And he said to Thomas, without any other preamble, he said, stick your finger out here and stick it in my hand and reach hither your hand and thrust it into my side and don't be faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said, my Lord and my God. All of a sudden, the realization came upon him that Jesus was not only his Lord, not only his Messiah, not only his Savior, but he was also his God. And that was quite a thing. And Jesus said, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they who have not seen and yet have believed. And that's us. You know, we come all the way down to the 20th century. And here we are. We stand here today and we believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. We believe it because we have the testimony of Peter and James and John and Paul and the others, all of whom saw him alive after he had been dead. 
And so we also have this blessing upon us. Well, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Now, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, in the Sea of Galilee. That's what that is. Now, it's in, Matthew tells us that he told the women, he said, go tell my disciples that I go before them to Galilee and I will see them there. And he set them a place where they were supposed to go and where they were going to meet him up there. But again, they had gone back. Now, again, why were they back in Galilee? Well, the days of unleavened bread were over. They obviously stayed in Jerusalem through that time and somewhat beyond it. And I can kind of halfway understand why they would linger there. But Jesus said, no, I want to see you in Galilee. Why? Well, I was home. And they needed to go on back home. Probably they had things to finish. They had details to work out before they returned to Jerusalem. Why were they back in Jerusalem? Well, because they were going to be back down there for Pentecost. And Pentecost was the day on which the Holy Spirit was going to be poured out upon them. So they went back up to the area. And while they were there, they'd gone back home. Simon Peter in verse 3 says, I think I'd better go fishing. That was their business. That was their job. And I don't know. At this point in time, they did not know what was coming. They did not know how long they would have to wait. They probably were smart enough to know, unlike some of us, that God's watch runs at a different speed from ours, and that what we think is a long time, God thinks is very quick. Well, Simon Peter said, I go fishing. And they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went forth, and they entered into a ship immediately, and all that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, and the disciples did not realize that it was him. And he said, children, do you have any food? Calling out across the water of the ship. And they said, no, we haven't caught anything. And he said, well, try the other side of the ship. You're on the, you're on the wrong side of the boat. And, they, and you shall find something. And they did that. And all of a sudden, they couldn't get the, the, the net back into the boat because it was full of fish. Now, they knew that things like that didn't just happen by moving the net from one side of the boat to the other. And the, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved, who is John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that he was the Lord, he put his fisher's coat on him, for he was naked, and cast himself into the sea. And I suppose this time of year, a little later, it might have been warm up there and working hard as they were. I expect it was simpler to work naked than it was to wear clothes that you had to wash later. The other disciples came in a little ship because they were not far from the land, but it was 200 cubits dragging the net with fishes. They didn't try to get it in the boat. They just pulled it onto the shore. And then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Now, what is kind of interesting about this I don't know why it had never really quite occurred to me the same way before, but you remember when Jesus fed the 5,000? You look back at that, and it's tempting to go and see all kinds of symbolism between the bread and breaking the bread and the miracle of the bread and feeding all these people and why did Jesus bother and so forth. But it did occur to me when I was doing the Sermon on Grace and, and, and looking at the God of the Old Testament and how, that, how gracious he was in his dealings with people when he did appear in the flesh, that Jesus was doing what a hospitable, a gracious person would do. He was feeding his guests. These people had all come out to hear him. He had taught them. They brought no food. They were, they were his disciples. And he did what he could do. He fed his guests as any gracious man who had the power to do it would do it. And Jesus is standing on the shore. He doesn't call them in and wait for them to build a fire and wait for them to, to cook the fish and clean the fish and so forth. He has the fire built, the fish laid on it, already cooking out for everyone. He has bread there toasting alongside the fire and heating up. So that when they arrive, after having worked all night, he has prepared food for them. I think it's an interesting little insight into him and the way he works, for he did not have to do that. I think it's in, rather interesting also that they took the trouble to record that. And Jesus said, bring some of the fish you've caught. And Peter went up and drew the land the, uh, to land uh, the net full of great fishes, 153. And for all that, there were so many, the net was not broken. And Jesus said, come and dine. And what's interesting about this, at this point, not one of them, it says, dared to ask him, who are you? They all knew it was the Lord. But the fact that they were not, they, they didn't dare to ask him that they kind of knew it was him, is interesting all by itself, because they have seen him alive. You would think they would know. And then there were the disciples on the road to Emmaus that walked alongside him and talked with him and didn't know who he was. It really makes you wonder sometimes, you know, what, 
What kind of changes had taken place in him over this period of time? Why was it that they did not recognize him? For although he appeared to them with his holes in his hand and a, and a, and a spear wound in his side at one point, yeah, I'd rather gather that as he appeared to them in the flesh after this period of time, that he looked quite different to all of them. But they sat down and they were eating, and he had this ridiculously awkward situation where nobody's saying anything about who this is. Well, Jesus came and he took bread, and he gave it to them and the fish also. This is the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was risen from the dead. Now, when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Now, I gather from what comes on a little later that they were not merely sitting around the fire, that they had t gotten up and had started walking along the beach or along the, the gravel shore of the Sea of Galilee at this time when he starts talking to Peter because, one, the speech is for Peter. It isn't really for the others. It's a particular challenge for him. Uh, secondly, later on, we'll have him, you know, we see that John is following or walking along some little distance behind them. But the conversation is for Peter. In this conversation, Jesus says, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me more than these? I don't know what these is. I've heard sermons down through the years from all kinds of people about what these are, these being going fishing, your business, things of this world, the other disciples. I mean, what? It, I don't really think it matters very much. Do you love me more than all this? Was what Jesus said. When Jesus, Peter did not even bother asking him what all this was. He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. Now, the question logically arises, why is Peter getting this little third degree here when nobody else is? And I think the answer is not so much that Peter was the all-important one, as it is that Peter had denied Christ three times. So three times he is now asked to affirm his love for Christ in this situation. And it isn't as though Christ doubts Peter. I think as much as anything else, it is to establish or to eradicate the doubts in Peter's own mind about whether or not he is now accepted by Jesus. And you can understand why he would feel awfully guilty, can't you? About having denied Christ three times and really wondering, since he knew Jesus knew everything and was going to know that he'd done it and told him ahead of time he was going to do it, to wonder how Jesus felt about him. So these three times, Jesus says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I have affection for you. Now, we, I've heard a lot of messages also about this, that Peter sort of dodges the question a little bit, because Jesus uses the word agape for love, and Peter responds with adelphos, which basically is a kind of brotherly love, and isn't quite the same thing. Well, he basically gave him the challenge, and he said, feed my lambs. And he said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Using the same word, he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then he said, okay, feed my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you really have affection for me? He switches to Simon's own word at this point. And Simon Peter was grieved because he asked him this the third time. It really bothered him and hurt him, as well it might. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said finally the third time, feed my sheep. Now, when I read this, I sometimes wonder if we have the right handle on our mission. Evangelism is very high on our list of priorities, but Jesus' commission was not so much to evangelize when you look at it, at least not to evangelize in the way that we use the term. The word evangelize basically means to spread the good news. You know, it means, you know, it comes from the word evangelion, which means the good news, and it turns it into a verb form, which means to good news everybody, as it were, or to proclaim get glad tidings or the good news. And so uh, the idea is almost as though the proclamation of the good news is like an announcement. You know, you can put a sign on a bulletin board and you've done your job. Or you can have a television program that goes out to all the you know, places around and it proclaims a kind of form of the good news and you've done your job. But if you go back and actually look at this, it doesn't, doesn't say evangelize. It is not a commission to evangelize. You know, evangelize is kind of a general word that we, we gather around this. But look at what it says in Matthew 28 and verse 19. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations 
baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Now, historically, we have called this the uh, twofold commission. The first commission is to proclaim the gospel to the world for a witness. The second commission is to feed the flock. That is to teach the flock, the sheep of God, once they have come in to the, uh, to the flock of God. Actually, what if this is not a twofold commission? What if this is all just one statement of commission? Because a disciple is what? It's somebody you teach. It's a pupil, a student. Someone who comes in, sits down, and you explain things, teach, and teach things to them. He wants you to make students, he said, out of all nations. Now, in the process of turning a person into a disciple of Jesus, you have not made that person a converted person. All they are doing at this point is learning from him. Jesus, while he was here on the earth, had disciples in their hundreds, perhaps in their thousands of people who walked up and down the roads behind him, people who gathered around wherever he were, was, and they said they believed him. They believed him up to a point. And beyond that point, there was one occasion where his sayings got a little tough for them, and it said from that day many of his disciples turned back and did not go any further with him. So it's a distinction, I think, that we might want to, to keep in mind. We can make disciples. Jesus Christ will build his church out of and around those disciples. We don't actually build the church. We make disciples. Now, how do you make a disciple? Well, if you look at this again, it could be as easily saying, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them, that it is in the process of teaching that we make the disciples. Because after all, you're trying to turn them into pupils, into learners who receive the teaching and respond to the teaching, right? So teaching and making disciples there's really not much between them. Our task then is to go out and make disciples. Now, I am not so sure as I said that this is a twofold commission. In Jesus' words to Peter, feed my sheep. He has said the equivalent of what he said when he said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, right? You would consider, most people would describe, Christian people would describe what I'm doing right now as feeding God's sheep. You know, and you often will use these terms of yourself. You know, we get spiritual food here. I come to be nourished spiritually and to hear the word, you know, read and spoken and taught and so forth. So we could argue that that's what's going on here. But this is a different commission from the first commission only if you assume that Jesus' sheep are to be found only in the church. Think about that. You can consider Peter's, to, Peter's feed my sheep as the second commission only if you consider that all of God's sheep are in the church. Is that true? If you'll turn back a few pages in John to chapter 9, because I want you to try to get you to think about this a little differently, to think outside the box, and we'll try not to lose track of where the box is while we think outside the box. Jesus passed by, and he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, Neither one, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, made clay of the spittle, and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, <coughs> And said, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. And he went his way and washed and came seeing. Now, why do you think that Jesus spat on the ground and made clay and put it on this man's eyes and healed him this way? Because he could have done it by saying the word, couldn't he? He could have done it just by putting his thumbs on the guy's eyes. And, or he could have clapped him on the ears and said, Be healed, like some evangelist might do. Uh, you know, he might have flopped him on the ground, slain in the spirit. He could have done a lot of things. Why did he do that? Well, it was, I think, a deliberate provocation of the Pharisees. Because to make clay on the Sabbath day, and this was on the Sabbath day, is work. And you're not supposed to do that. You know, you wouldn't make mortar and build your house on the Sabbath day, would you? Well, of course not. 
Well, what are you doing making clay to heal a man's eyes? I mean, aren't there six days of the week when you can heal people? What are you healing them on the Sabbath day for? Well, that was there. That was the interpretation of the existing authority. Jesus is here to say, sorry, boys, I'm the authority. I am your interpretive authority on the law. What I say can be done on the Sabbath is what can be done. That's one of his points. And so he seemed to be deliberately, wherever it was convenient for him to do so, provoking these people. There were, like I said, a man with a withered hand could have been healed any day of the week. Jesus healed him in the synagogue on the Sabbath day in front of a whole bunch of people just by speaking the word because he wanted to make his point, not merely about who he was, but that their interpretations of the Sabbath were all wrong. Now the neighbors, therefore, and they that had before seen him when he was blind said, hey, isn't that the guy that was begging over here that was blind all this period of time? And some people said, well, it's, I think it's him. And others said, well, he's like him. And while the man heard him speaking, he says, hey, folks, I'm the guy. I'm the one. Therefore, they said to him, well, how were your eyes open? He said, a man who is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and I washed and I can see. Hard to imagine what that meant to him. Well, then they said to him, well, where is he? And he said, I don't know. So they took him to the Pharisees that had been born blind before. It was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees asked him, how did you receive your sight? He said, well, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and I can see. And then said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath day. Well, now, that's a logical statement, by the way. There was not, this is not necessarily a wrong precept that he's dealing with here. Because it's the, the fact that a man might be able to perform a miracle, but who breaks God's law, uh, that's something you've got to watch out for. So in raising that question, they, had to, they, they, they were justified in at least raising the question. Others said, well, how can a man who is a sinner do miracles like what this guy is doing? And they said to the blind man again, well, what do you say of him that has opened your eyes? And the man said, well, uh, I, I guess he's a prophet. But the Jews wouldn't believe that he had actually been blind and they, until they called his parents in. And they asked them, saying, is this your son whom you say was born blind? Yeah. How come he sees? And his parents said, well, we know this was our son. We know he was born blind. But as to how he can see now, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know who opened his eyes. We don't know it. He's of age. Ask him. He shall speak for himself. Now, the reason they were so cagey was because they were afraid because the Jews had already agreed that if anybody confessed that he was the Christ, that he would be put out of the synagogue. And he said, I think I lost my, turned over one page too many. Therefore, said his parents, he is of age. Ask him. Then again, they called the man that was born blind and said, give God the praise. We know this man is a sinner. And he said, well, now, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not. I know one thing. I got one thing and I got it down pat. I was blind. Now I see. And they said to him again, well, what did he do? How did he open your eyes? You know, just going on and on and on. And he said, I've told you already and you didn't listen. What do you want to hear it again for? He's pretty bold and pretty cocky, this fellow. And I... I think you might be the same way if you'd been blind for all those years, and now you're able to see. And he said, well, uh, you, why do you want to hear it again? You want to be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, you are his disciple. We are Moses' disciple. Well, there is a difference, isn't there? We know that God spoke unto Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he comes from. And the man answered and said, why, herein is a marvelous thing. Sarcasm is dripping. Herein is a marvelous thing that you don't know where he came from, and yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and does his will, him God hears. Since the world began, knows it never heard that any man had opened the eyes of one that was born blind. I gather there had been healings of blind people, but never of someone that was born that way. If this man were not of God, he could not do anything. And they answered and said, you were all together born in sins, and you're going to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. When Jesus heard they'd cast him out, he went and found him, and he said, do you believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? That's really astonishing. This is really astonishing. This man wasn't healed because of his faith. He was healed because he was picked out 
as a deliberate provocation to the scribes and Pharisees to accomplish specifically what Jesus wanted to do, to make a statement he wanted to make, he picked him out. Then something interesting happens on that. He said, well, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said, you have both seen him, and it's he that talks with you. It's me. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he did obeisance to him. And Jesus said, for judgment, I am coming to this world that they which don't see might see, and they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees who were standing nearby heard these words and said, well, are you saying that we're blind? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would have no sin. Now you say we see, your sin remains. Basically what he's telling them is you don't have any excuse. If you were blind, you would have some excuse. And then he launches into what I wanted to talk to. I gave you all that to give you a little bit of background leading up to chapter 10, where Jesus addresses this question of who his sheep are. And I don't know that we really quite have got our minds around this, because when Peter said, he kept telling Peter, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep three times. That the implication of this that's long been drawn in churches in our tradition is that that was an admonition to feed the church. It was to help the church to grow, to get the church people together. Feed my sheep. Does the church are my sheep? Well, now, who, was, who were God's sheep before Jesus showed up? Who were God's sheep before he built the church? For, in fact, he said, in the future tense, he said, upon this rock, I will build my church in the future and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Did he have no sheep at this time? Were there none prior to this time? When did he finally have some sheep? Well, these men, who were the shepherds of Israel, the Pharisees, who sat in Moses' seat, who would throw a man out of the synagogue for no other reason than had he stood there before them and said, I was born blind, now I can see. How has it happened? A man named Jesus made clay, put it on my eyes, said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. I went and washed, and I can see. I don't know anything about this man. I'm not vouching for him or against him. I'm just saying this is a marvelous thing. The man you never heard of has been able to make me see. And you don't know anything about him, and you don't know where he comes from, and you can't vouch for him. And they threw him out of the synagogue for that. These were, up until this point, the shepherds of Israel. Verily I say unto you, chapter 10, he that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He calls his own sheep by name. Now that is really interesting. I, I didn't know shepherds named their sheep. I don't think for the most part they do because there are too many of them. And, and you know, you've seen one sheep, you've seen them all. But maybe, maybe not. Maybe shepherds are able to spot those differences. But nevertheless, he says he calls his own sheep by name. He knows them and leads them out. And when he puts forth his sheep, he goes before him and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Now, I don't know how to explain this to you. I'm just going to tell you that it is so. That in the world at large today, wherever you may go and in whatever circumstances, do you meet people who for whatever reason seem to know Jesus' voice? You can stand up and preach. You can proclaim His Word. You can preach from His Word. I can do it over the radio. And don't make any mistake. I'm not talking about my voice being Jesus' voice. Nothing of the kind. But what I am doing is I'm taking the words of Jesus and I am reading them over the air, and I'm teaching from the words of Jesus. And what is really astonishing to me is that there are people who seem to recognize his voice. It, they don't, you don't have to prove a lot of stuff to them. Maybe they have to evaluate the scriptures. Certainly, they have to look them up. They have to prove all things. But it is really funny. You know, we've noticed for many long years the, uh, the fact that there are some people that you explain the truth to, and it's like talking to a post there are other people you start explaining the truth to and they soak it up like a dry sponge and want more. I mean, that phenomenon is sometimes very difficult to explain. The Worldwide Church of God explained it by a curious doctrine of election that, well, God's blinded some people and opened some people's minds, which I'm not particularly going to argue with that. But out of that doctrine of election came an idea somehow that, that we are, you know, it doesn't really matter whether we take the gospel over here. It doesn't really matter whether we take the gospel there. That, you know, that maybe God isn't calling these people. And we kind of, in the past, I think, have justified 
a lack of activity, a lack of energy, and a lack of drive on our part by the assumption, man, God's not calling those people anyway. Well, I will say this. I do believe that, that, that trying to argue someone into the faith is an exercise in futility. I do believe that there are people who, when they come into contact with God's voice, as it were, in the Scriptures, they recognize His voice and they are drawn to Him almost immediately. But, where are His sheep? Where are you going to find them? And how hard are we expected to go looking for them? And how do you know when you come into a city, whether God has many people there or as few? Because when He came to Corinth, God says, you stay here. You work here because I have much people in this city. Who were they? Paul didn't know. Paul didn't even know they were there. Paul had no idea whether there would be 100 converts, 200 converts, or 2,000 converts in this city when he walked into it. So what was he supposed to do? Well, about all he could do was do what you and I can do, and that's our best. We put ourselves in the way of people. We put the gospel in the way of people. And we trust that God's sheep will know his voice. But I think we need to understand that all of God's sheep are not in what you and I call the church. Read on what Jesus says in this particular situation. He says, a stranger they won't follow. They'll flee him because they don't know the voice of strangers. This parable spoke Jesus unto them, but they did not understand the things that he spoke to them. And he said, look, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep wouldn't hear them. And the fact is that what he is referring to is that gang of Pharisees who would put a man out of the synagogue because he was healed by someone they did not recognize as an authority. You know, the way in which these men conducted their affairs, the way in which they accused Jesus of being demon-possessed, the way in which they condemned him by calling him illegitimate in birth, all the names they called him all this period of time establishes these people as thieves and robbers. They are not the good shepherds of the sheep. And he says in this particular thing, the sheep will not hear them, and they're afraid of them, and they won't follow him. And I think whenever you read the New Testament and you see who the people are that are drawn to Jesus, they are not the religious establishment, are they? The religious establishment rejected him. Who followed him? Well, fishermen, who were probably something close to the second lowest rung of society, maybe the lowest, it just depends on whether they or the shepherds would have been considered, the sheep herders, would have been considered the lowest rung of society at that time. A tax collector, a guy who was generally regarded as a thief in the society at that time, a man who was hated and despised, uh, perhaps even more than the IRS agent would be today. And so on it goes. These were not you know, the, the authorities, they were not the religious establishment were the people. These were the people, though, who were leading the people. And those, those people who were in those positions of authority, he said, the, my sheep don't respond to those men. And as a consequence, there was a very large body of people in, that for, in first century in Judea who were neither Pharisees nor Sadducees, who basically, uh, they were religious, they believed in God, and as far as that's concerned, they kept the holy days, they kept the Sabbath, they went down to the Passover and sacrificed the lamb and all of that, but as far as being a part of one of those outfits, no. No, they weren't. There is a presumption on many people's part reading the New Testament that there were really everybody in, in Judea in that time was divided into two camps, Pharisees and Sadducees. You know human nature, you should know better than that. You should realize that these are the two camps of the political establishment of the time, and that the vast majority of the people were neither. And that whatever faith they had was kept to themselves, or, you know, it was a very practical faith, possibly. I am the door. By me, if any man will enter in, he shall be saved and go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. The hireling flees because he's a hireling and doesn't care for the sheep. Who is the shepherd who cares for the sheep? It's Jesus, pure and simple. There is one shepherd, 
And I guess the rest of us who many people might call shepherds of the sheep or pastors of the flock really are far better described probably as sheepdogs. The ones that the shepherd sends running out there to do a little barking to kind of head them back this way perhaps. Uh, to do something of that nature. But to say that we are the good shepherd, no. No. That's not us. He is the only one who is the shepherd. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and I am known of mine. As the Father knows me, so I know my Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Then he says this, And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, Every once in a while, we come across that, and we wonder what he meant by that. Well, by and large, I think a reader and listener to him who heard him make this statement at the time, his own disciples sitting around him, probably thought what he meant was that the fold was Israel. And they may or may not have, by this time, begun to get their mind around the fact that Jesus was not going to be a shepherd only to Israel. That he intended to be a shepherd to the entirety of the world. He was going to call sheep from everywhere. And... So he did. But what he is saying, this is another one of those little hints in Jesus' Gospels, that he intends to look out to the entirety of the world. Now, other sheep I have that are not of this fold is really fascinating because down through time, it's a habit of religious organizations and of churches to start trying to develop a, uh, what word, a criteria for the definition of the one true church. And by the strangest coincidence, the criteria that define the one true church are also defining criteria of that particular group. In other words, let's see what we're like. Well, this is, this is what the one true church is like. So we put down our criteria. The one true church is like this. Look, well, surprise, surprise. We match these criteria. We are the one true church. The problem with it is that whatever place you find yourself... With whatever group you find yourself in, whether it be with one of the corporate churches, a local church, or whatever you find yourself in, or be it in the Worldwide Church of God many years ago when they thought they were the only, we, all of us thought we were the only one true church that there was, whatever you find yourself at that point in time, you should always realize that this is not all there is to God's sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. Where are they? I don't know. But you see, if you are going to serve Christ, then you need to be on the lookout for his sheep. You need to try to care for his sheep. You need to go find his sheep. Get up and get off and across the mountains and down the valleys and over the hills and look wherever you can to find, help him find his sheep because that is what we are on about. And he does goes on to say, they will hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. You know, in a sense, there is today one fold and one shepherd. The one shepherd is Jesus. But the one fold is not so easy to spot because he has his boundary around that fold. When you go across England, I don't know how it's done in the sheep country in this country. I've, I've been more exposed to sheep in the United Kingdom than I have here. But you go up into that country and you'll find sheep all over the hillsides. I mean, you know, wandering across the road and uh, there are no fences. They don't pay much. If there are, they're old rock fences, and they tend to be broken down. The sheep find their way through them somewhere. So the sheep are all over the place. And you'll find the sheep that belong to, to uh, McGillicuddy over here and the sheep that belong to Macomb over there and all of them. And they go out, and you go out and say, well, how does anyone know whose sheep's whose? Well, they got little marks on them. They paint them. I don't know if they use a spray can or a brush with paint, but they slap a daub of paint of a certain color in a certain location on their sheep. And so when the time comes to go out and they gather all the sheep up together, they can go in and they can separate and they know by the marks on the sheep whose sheep are whose. And Jesus said, my sheep, I know my sheep. He doesn't have to put a mark on them. He knows them. And they know him and they respond to him. And I think what we're reading here is that if we, if we would think, can realize this is that just because we're out here wandering around in the world with a whole bunch of other people doesn't mean that Christ doesn't know who we are and where we are and what we are doing, and that he isn't taking care of us like a good shepherd would. Because a lot of the time, a good, the good shepherd leaves the sheep alone. What's the, what's the work of sheep? Well, they eat grass, and they make wool, and they make mutton. That's what sheep do. And that doesn't require you to do very much with them or for them at any given point in time. And I think God puts us out here in the world to learn, to experience, to do, 
to find others who are of like mind, to be able to help him do his work and reaching out to people wherever we are. We have our work that we are supposed to be doing. Oh, by the way, that's one of the work that sheep do. They make more sheep, don't they? And that, of course, is, I guess, one of the things he expects us to be doing. So his fold is worldwide, and he knows where his sheep are. And the time comes when he pulls all his sheep back together. Now, I said all that to say this, that there are a lot of people around who are busy building fences and creating folds, you know, and we gather up all the sheep that we think belong to us and we put them over here in this fold over here. And this guy gathers up all the sheep he think belong to him and he puts them over here in this pen. And you got little sheep pens all over the place, you know, that, uh, where people are gathered together. But there's a funny thing about this. Sooner or later, they got to let those sheep out of those pens to go out on the hillside. And when they do, we're going to be together. And we need to understand at any given point in time that no matter who's got us pinned up, and no matter where we are, no matter who's shearing us, if I may use that analogy, <laughs> we still belong to one shepherd. And I think we would also need to understand that when we gather together all the Sabbath-keeping, Holy Day-keeping people together, all in one mystical body of people, that Jesus would say to us still, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. And that for us to think that we are all there is, we are the people, and wisdom will die with us, and we have the knowledge, and we have the lock on God's Word, we are making a very large mistake. Now, God has His standards, and God has His expectations, and it may well be, you know, you're supposed to, what, what, what Peter was told to do was feed my sheep. To me, this is the same thing as saying, go and make disciples of all nations and teach them to do all things that I have commanded you. And that in the process of going to the world, in the process of you in a doctor's office leaving a brochure sitting there on the, on the stand that tells somebody something that would help them through a time of difficulty, you may reach out there and you may, may reach one of those sheep and you may feed one of his sheep by leaving something like that for them. And when they pick it up, and when they read it, they will hear his voice and they will know his voice as he touches their heart and as he reaches down and begins to work in their life. I think when the command comes out to feed my sheep, we need to realize he has other sheep that are not of this fold, sheep about whom we know very little, with whom we have had very little contact, and that the work to be done for us and by us down through the years that follow is a lot bigger than any of us ever would realize. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. And he seems to me, to Peter and to all of us, to be saying, I want you to go find them and feed them. In the process of feeding them, you will actually save lives. You will actually lead to people becoming disciples of Jesus. You will actually cause people to come to baptism and eventually to be in the kingdom of God. People who otherwise might be lost. Pray about that and think about that.